So because Smart Cities is so new in the U.S., maybe not around the world, but in the U.S., what I've been hearing in the conference is that it takes an inspired individual mm -hmm. to maybe tie different areas together, whether it's public sector, private sector, something in between. And from our conversation, I gather that that person in, in Portland is you. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about the different positions you hold and how you kind of tie those groups together. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I, I guess I have an advantage. I, I spent 23 years at Intel Corporation in, in Portland, Oregon, and, and and, uh, and had a lot of opportunity to work in a number of different areas in research and technology. And I saw the innovation that was going on in smart cities and, and where it's going and, and how it really has big impact. I also saw that, uh, that a lot of that technology development was actually happening outside the United States. Yeah. Um, and friends of mine got involved in, uh, one of them became a White House fellow as part of the National Institute, Institute of Standards and Technology mm -hmm. um, and pulled me into some of the work that was going on there. Um, and I, I saw that there was an enormous opportunity in the U.S. to, to move things forward and, and become a leader in the world of, of smart technology. Um, and so uh, engaging with Portland, I, I hold a position at Portland State University as a professor um, and, uh, and I've been an adjunct there teaching for a while. So I had some contacts there. I have very good friends who are parts of, of small and large business, um, again, through a lot of the contacts with uh, that I've developed through through uh, Intel, so um, so it was good to be in that position. But I could say that there that Portland is an exciting city with a lot of people who have cross contacts, and and so there's a there's a core of people there who really do understand this in Portland, and it's been very exciting to work with those people and all the areas that they're in. I mean, as you as you rightly point out, the 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 community is very large. I mean, everything from transportation to water services sure. to electricity. You need a group of people who really understand this. Uh, one of the things I think we've learned in, in Portland is the interconnectivity of these. You can't really right. just go and silo a solution in one area. It doesn't make a smart city. Mm -hmm. What you really need is you need uh, a sort of common base of data and code that allows you to build a set of services on top of that base. Mm -hmm. So you want the city as a platform to operate at, you know, and, and provide data that then innovators can come in and they can, they can work with that data and provide really high value services. Mm -hmm. Portland's been been early in some of this. I mean, yeah. uh, very early on, Portland uh, made its transit data, all of its, uh, you know, it has Macs, it has streetcar, it has buses, and it made that data available um, publicly. Uh, mm -hmm. And that spurred a lot of innovation around applications that people could use to figure out exactly where a bus was and how to leave the office at the right time, not get caught in the rain, get on a bus, go to where they needed to go. As an off night, I'm a little envious of that, but we're working <laughs> on it. We're working on it. What it, was the inspiration? I mean, I I think you were really mm -hmm. ahead of the time in that kind of thinking. Just some very innovative people in, nice. the, in the in the in the uh, in the governor's office. I mean, in the in the mayor's office. Great. Very very smart people who were ahead of their time in the thinking, and they got it going. Um, you know, when when and and it really it really has sort of spurred a number of things. And Portland has been the the originator of the of the standard that Google uses in their maps mm -hmm. data for for transit because of that. Um, I think the challenge that we had at the time, of course, was that being just one city. Uh, a lot of those applications, a lot of that innovation was sort of stuck within sure. within Portland. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things we're working on very very actively right now is sort of building these communities, getting together with other cities because that will really spur the innovation. When right. when a you know an entrepreneur in Austin or in Portland or in Porto or you know anywhere in the world can come up with an application that will, for example, um, make it possible for for the blind to find an, an easy way through the yeah. city transit system, you know that's too small a, a community for one city but right. it went, once you start to link cities together those kinds of applications that could be so valuable um, become possible yeah. and so looking for those kinds of communities has been has been important to us we've recently teamed up with uh, with a group called Fireware who I think mm. you may have may have met up with right. um, and we're working with them and and the smart cities smart city SDK work trying to find ways to build that kind of platform in a way that could be uh, useful across the board so yeah. so that you know that and we have been teaming with I mentioned Porto uh, in Portugal they had a lot of very similar projects to the Portland projects and mm -hmm. so we've been working with them just to understand you know when they're doing an air quality sensor and we're doing an air quality sensor we can trade information we can learn uh, from one another what's going on accelerate yeah. our innovation so so those communities are really important and how they work together so, I mean even just that idea is transformative mm -hmm. it takes economic development in a traditional sense and turns it on its head and a couple of the themes that have been coming out of this conference is the citizen is at the center 
technology is the enabler yes. and the fact that cities who would normally compete for mm -hmm. economic development or in an economic development sense are now sharing information in order to create better communities. It, it's a key learning. It's I, really I, important. Yeah, it is, it's absolutely exactly the core of this. And, and I think we learned that early on, you know, the, the tendency when you engage with, with technology companies is that they have a solution and they want to bring it to various places. Sure. It's, as you say, it's sort of the economic infrastructure is, well, if I can build something and I can repeat it in a lot of places. The problem is from a corporate perspective, that tends to force a uniformity on the citizens right. that is not tolerable. None of us right. want to have to sort of live in a uniform, structured way. We want to live our own lives. If you put the citizen in the center and you say, okay, so how can the technology be brought to the citizen in a way that is flexible? So two communities next to one another can actually make different priorities. Right. One, one community might think that health is a priority. Another community might think security is a priority. How do you bring them technology such that they can use it to their own ends? Yeah, and this fantastic. idea of sort of, yeah, this idea of sort of flexibility and the ability to have access to a large market of applications that might be, you know, might be globally available allows you to say, okay, so I'm going to join a community for you know for the disabled that gets around town or I might want to join a community that is particularly interested in health or in particularly interested in in security um, and and have that data brought to me in the way that I want it yeah so it's a it's a very big shift of the last few years and mm -hmm. I think it's crucial to the success I right? think so yeah, too yeah. and it really fits the way we work yeah. and live I mean, yes so yeah. many of my colleagues and even myself and my husband we kind of live in multiple cities at the same time and the yeah. technology can enable us to do that so yes no it's it's, it's really important I mean I I love the fact that I can use my car to go card down here as exactly. I can use it up there and those are the kinds of platform standards that you have to have Right. right now the big companies can provide some of that but it tends to silo um, around that technology mm -hmm. pillar and we it's important to do that. It's important to be able to, to take, you know, an Uber here and an Uber in, in Portland and an Uber in, in DC or, or to use your car to go card. But those transport methods also need to work with one another. And sure. that's tricky, right? So so that I should be able to open a single application and see, well, my choices for getting across Austin are car to go, Uber, Lyft, you mm -hmm. know, whatever it is and 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 then I can get on to, onto a, a bike share and get onto metro and whatever yep. it is and get across town so that platform needs to be able to integrate across these sort of what have traditionally mm -hmm. been siloed mm -hmm. and that's that's really this putting the citizen at the center look at yep. it from that point of view what am I trying to do to use the city correctly yep. and how does how does the technology help me do that and so the infrastructure to run it all right. so it's all connected and fueled by next generation networks exactly yeah. exactly yeah so speaking of transportation mm -hmm. you all were recently awarded at this mm -hmm. conference tell me a little bit about this yeah. and what you're planning to do with the with the reward yes well we have um, what the a project we've been working on for a little while now is, is what we call the PAL project. So mm -hmm. in Portland, uh, US 26, which is a highway, runs uh, runs really right through the city. Mm -hmm. um, and on the east side, it, it runs through an area that, that really is in need of economic development. Nice. There is some going on already um, that what we call the PAL corridor is between the street called PAL, which is 26, and, and Division, which is a very up and coming, uh, trendy uh, street. And, and there's, a, there's several blocks in between with a bike lane down it. And we see it now as an opportunity to, to really revitalize that whole area. And so there's a lot of development work that's going in there. Uh, the question is how do you use technology to make better decisions about how that de those development dollars are Great. spent. Yeah. There's a lot of discussion about a bus rapid transit lane there, mm -hmm. there's a lot of discussion about you know, the, the way in which you could build um, you know, sort of transit points or transit hubs. But without data, you don't really know if you're improving yeah. things. So, so the this project was really to go in initially and understand how to uh, monitor traffic, monitor air quality, track all of that data together, and sort of get a baseline for mm -hmm. how PAL looks now. Um, so as, as those developments happen, we can see, are we improving air quality? Are we improving sound quality? Are we, are we making this a more livable place? Um, so that's been very exciting, and, and we have now um, managed to build some air quality sensors. We're showing one here that is much lower cost. So the traditional air quality sensor that a city would use, very high, very high uh, quality, very high resolution, but, but very expensive, about $100,000 a piece. So a city typically only has one or two of those, and they put them at a school in order to make sure that the school air is safe. What we really need is something that's more in the thousand dollar level. Mm -hmm. So as you can put several hundred of them, we would like to put them all down PAL. So as we can see the patterns down PAL, mm -hmm. you could see things like, you know, if you stop uh, large trucks at, 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 at stoplights, when they start up, they generate diesel. We know mm -hmm. these things, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of things we don't fully understand about what creates 
the bad air quality. In, in, and so having a series of sensors allows you to look for patterns, allows you to see how, um, you know, how, how particulates in the environment are moving around, and will tell us a lot more. So, um, so we've started to put uh, some of these sensors on PAL. We're, we're, getting, we're still getting the price down. We've, we've got down below $1,000. We want to deploy a lot of them. And then That's we want fantastic. to look at various modeling techniques for how that works. Mm -hmm. So we got, we got a, a very nice award here from US Ignite, mm -hmm. um, and we will use that to move the project forward. In particular, um, working out how to bring that data back to uh, um, um, a, a decision theater that we're building mm -hmm. at, at Portland State University, so a place where people can go and look at that data. Um, we'll use that for educational purposes. The students will be able to use it and see how this data is, is usable. And, and, and we're partnered with, uh, with the city of Portland, and particularly the Bureau of, Bureau of Planning, uh, Bureau of Technology, uh, and they will have the opportunity to come in and see that data and make decisions around it. Mm -hmm. So it's really sort of starting that idea of how do you have a data-driven city? How do you bring data in that allows you to make better decisions? So when you know hundreds or, or even billions of dollars are spent on a co transit corridor like PAL, because mm -hmm. there are lots of of developers doing development along there. How do we make sure that those dollars are spent wisely and that they make the environment better for people who live in the area, yeah. rather than, you know, rather than just, uh, you know, another another development. Right. right. Well, so it's so nice really that data will be driving those mm -hmm. decisions yeah. along with citizens, so you can really, really hone in what's best for right. your city. Yeah. There's actually some really interesting work that that we've started with with a couple of groups uh, in Portland. Um, uh, a guy called Tim Smith, who works at a company called Sarah Architects, has has a concept of, of civic ecology, sure. where he goes into a community and he works with them to understand what he calls flows. So, mm -hmm. where do they get their water from? Where do they get their electricity from? Where do, where do they get their food from? And, and works with that community to really understand what's important to them because mm -hmm. what you find is that all these communities really are different. Right. So as you go down a, a street like Powell, you know, um, some communities might be, well, you know, what we really want is we want better food, so we want a farmer's market and we would like a farmer's market here. Other communities might be focused at transit. They might say, yeah. well, you know, most of us commute to town every day and we have mm -hmm. to have an easy way to get into town. And once you start to understand that, you can start to first of all, help that community get what they what they want to live well, but then you can yeah. find ways for communities to work together. So as if, you know, farmer's market may not have been your top priority, but your neighboring community might, then mm -hmm. you know that you can get over to that farmer's market. And, and so that kind of focusing on, as you had pointed out earlier, technology is a way to get uh, to a community what a community wants. So that's been very interesting to us and Powell offers that for us. And we haven't, that's not part of this particular project, but it's been very important. It was used, Tim did a lot of work on, on division, which was the up and coming. And that we've learned a lot from that about how to, how to spur a community to be you know, an exciting community and, and to bring value to it. Um, and we're also spending a lot of time, I, I think um, uh, we're, we're one of the seven finalists for the right. USDOT yeah. program. I know that there are, I think six of the other cities are here too. But it seems like everyone's winning, even though there is one winner. I think it's very exciting. I, you know, the, the guys working on it, because we've put a lot of work into it. Sure. And now, you know, you, 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 if, if you lose, you kind of, it's, it's a letdown, but the truth of the matter is we have an excellent plan. Yeah. And that was really worth doing. So, um, so you know, we're excited anyhow. We're, yeah. we're going to figure out ways to, to get some of this stuff done. But being the showcase for the United States yeah, and transportation yeah. is, a, is, a, sure. is exciting. Um, and we, you know, we, we would love to be that. And I know, yeah. I know you guys are Austin and, and you're also in the running too. We're rooting for everyone. Right. Yes, we are too. And of course, whoever wins, will all work together to, to try and make sure all the cities benefit from the knowledge that's gained. But, um, but that, you know, that, that project has, has allowed us to sort of look at other ways in which we could start to um, start, start to look at Powell really uh, in a much more holistic way, yeah. right? And, and, you know, that kind of innovative thinking and saying, well, what would you do with a corridor like Powell mm -hmm. in, you know, what's going to happen as, as autonomous vehicles become available, as electric vehicles become ubiquitous? How do you, how do you approach it? Because a lot of the decisions that are being made are, are decisions about infrastructure that's going to be with us for 50 years. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we're going to have self-driving cars in 10. Mm -hmm. So do we really want to have all those parking structures? I mean, do we yeah. really want to invest in large numbers of parking structures at this point? Or c could we look at how you might, uh, you know, platoon cars on a highway like 26 mm -hmm. and sort of get them out of town yeah. in a much more efficient way and take a lot of the land that's currently being used for parking and, and you know, and, and, and other vehicles to turn those into, yeah. into civic areas, places where people can 
can actually live their lives and, and be much more at a human scale. So, yeah. so there's a lot of really exciting stuff going on in this yeah. space. It, it's really exciting to hear what you guys mm -hmm. are doing and to see how the federal government is really playing a role mm -hmm. in inspiring the conversation mm -hmm. as opposed to figuring out the solution and then implementing it down. Yeah. I think it's just beautiful yeah. that we have to give a lot top of, down and bottom yeah. up are all working are together. Are all working together. Yeah, I think I think we have to give a lot of credit to DOT. I think they did a really excellent job with this. I mean, the the amount of, of sort of excitement that's been generated, not only by the fact that they concentrated the funds and 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 gave an an amount of money that could actually make a difference to yep. a city, but but because they also went out and 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 brought communities together to really talk about this, and you know that's it's very hard to do new things. Uh, without a sort of community around That's you, right. and, and particularly if you're an elected body, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of risk to that. Sure. Um, the the other things that are going on, we're part of Metro Lab. I think I mm -hmm. think you guys are too. Which is this collaboration between the university and the city, which yep. which is such a good idea because, you know, universities are there to experiment and to understand and to learn things, and cities really can't do that. I mean, right. they are elected officials. They get tax money. They're supposed to spend that money on providing services and meeting immediate uh, needs of citizens. And meeting the needs of citizens, yeah. and that's what they should be doing. And they shouldn't re really be taking risk, but they need to take those risks right. in this space. So how do you do that? Well, you team up with a university. The university can have to, can take the risk and can do the research. And when those those projects are successful, then the city can be in a very good position to deploy them. But you need that really close relationship so as they're seeing what's going on in the research and they can deploy it quickly. And the university needs the relevance, right? They don't want to be off sort of, I mean, it's very difficult for a university to put a device on a lamppost right. unless the city's there to help right. them do it. Yeah. So that collaboration has been really excellent for yeah. us.